Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll um, thank you for your very engaging uh, talk there. I can't promise to be quite as engaging and as exciting as that, but um, as a, an academic who's interested in British politics and has been researching aspects of British politics for a few years, one of the things that I became very interested in in the aftermath of the referendum was what the hell is going on? I think you yourself talked about this. We are starting to learn what the implications of leaving the European Union actually are. And as well as all the aspects to do with trade, to do with our uh, relationship with the, uh, with the European institutions themselves and the single market, one of the other things that's um, uh, perhaps exposed by uh, the uh, uh, Brexit, the possibility of Brexit, the potential of Brexit, the process of Brexit in particular, is uh, some of the kind of ambiguities, uh, some of the, uh, the, the lack of clarity and things we don't know, if you like, at the centre of the British constitution. And this has been exposed in particular by uh, uh, questions like, well, what is the status of the referendum? What's the role of Parliament in all of this? What's the role of the executive? Could uh, you arrow down? Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. The oh, <laughs> perhaps we could go one back step back. Sorry, I'm trying to get there. Right one, one. Okay, one. lovely, right. perfect. We'll start again. So, Article Fifty of the Lisbon Treaty, okay, says any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. So therefore the question becomes, what are the UK's constitutional requirements? And the answer is, nobody knows. Okay? Parliamentary sovereignty, of course, is something that's been much talked about and was much uh, talked about by Eurosceptics and Brexiteers in particular. It's a key principle of the British Constitution, but it is in practice uh, uh, qualified and somewhat murky. And this is because the UK Constitution itself, famously uncodified, it's not written down in one particular document, the relationship between different institutions are not clarified, but it's also therefore flexible, which is what made us uh, able to join the European Union and to absorb its laws and rules so uh, uh, effectively, if you like, it's, uh, uh, but it's also political. Uh, more than it is legal. And this means that the kind of political uh, 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 machinations, movements and debates around issues like Brexit can have very significant constitutional consequences. And this is why I think it's such a fascinating thing to study, but also something we should all be very aware of, whatever happens um, uh, uh, as a result of this process. So that post-referendum debate about who controls the process who triggers Article 50, for instance, and so on, has laid bare, I think, some of those ambiguities that remain unresolved and, I think, need to be resolved. And these are fundamental questions about who governs. Is it uh, the Crown, the ministers of the Crown, the executive, the Prime Minister, who dictates, um, uh, for example, when and whether to, uh, uh, in the early stages, for instance, trigger Article 50, set the parameters of negotiation and so on. Uh, is it Parliament that, that uh, has a say over that? What role do the people have in the end? And what about the devolved assemblies? All of these aspects of things that have uh, uh, added, you know, uh, uh, have created a, uh, an ambiguity and a lack of clarity, I think, about uh, where power really should lie and does lie in the British Constitution. So in the spirit of five um, points, uh, I'm going to look at, uh, if you wouldn't mind moving on, five um, particular potential positions. The arguments that were made in Parliament in that first sort of six months after the referendum, when the party leaderships were in disarray, uh, the Prime Minister resigned, the Labour Party was uh, in civil war, it actually meant that backbenchers uh, were speaking their minds quite clearly in Parliament and it allowed kind of uh, 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 um, 
positions to emerge that weren't necessarily directed by party leaderships. And I think that the positions that did emerge at that time have actually shaped the debate that still continues. So I'm going to look at the arguments that were made and what questions and implications that raises. So the first one is um, this, that the executive should make the key decisions uh, and control the process of Brexit. Okay? And there are several justifications being made for this. One is about the sovereignty of the people. The idea that uh, the referendum was an instruction given uh, by the real holders of sovereignty, the British people. Okay? A once and for all decision. So that sovereignty is very limited because they can't come back and say something else later on, for instance. Others have argued it's a temporary delegation of sovereignty by Parliament uh, 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 to the people. Um, as this is a quote from uh, our very own Frank Field here. Um, Woe betide us if we do not abide by that. Um, others have actually argued that the Crown, ministers of the Crown, are the ones that have the right to run this process and it's legally and constitutionally right for them to do so. But it remains nonetheless entirely legitimised by a referendum um, and that's an important point that we need to keep hold of others have made more pragmatic arguments, you remember about the, the, these arguments about needing to unbind the hands of our ministers not uh, allowing them to get out there and, and, and negotiate the best deal uh, for the country but these arguments dressed as they are in pra pragmatism and nonetheless have significant constitutional consequences. And the, the, the effect of these arguments is to deny parliamentary sovereignty, which is ironic, given that many of these who are arguing this point are arguing uh, uh, for Brexit and, parliament and the return of parliamentary sovereignty as they saw it. And those justifying it on the basis of sovereignty, that the people limit that sovereignty to one single irreversible decision for all time. So that is not sovereignty in my book. Okay, number two. Uh, that Parliament should set the agenda, support the key decisions and steer, uh, uh, steer the process. Now this has been, argument has been made from a number of different positions. One is that it's based on convention. Very important in a flexible constitution under the British constitution. What's been done before, it's the way things are done. The Lisbon Treaty was debated in Parliament in this sort of way, and therefore we should do the same, uh, 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 the same here. Others, and this particular quote comes from a Leave uh, campaigner and supporter, uh, a guy called Stephen Phillips, who eventually came very disillusioned and resigned his seat, um, but argues that Parliament's needed to fill in the gaps, because it's not clear. We can't extrapolate from the referendum what... Uh, what kind of uh, relationship with the European Union uh, people want. So that's perhaps the more kind of practical uh, argument and emphasises Parliament's deliberative role uh, in, in, uh, in coming to reasoned uh, decisions. Others have been much more aggressively assertive about the idea of parliamentary sovereignty, um, arguing that uh, 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 referendums are simply advisory and Parliament must have the final say. Many Remainers, many hardcore Remainers particularly, were making this argument uh, 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 after the referendum. Not too many in Parliament dared to stand up and say it, but people like uh, Brent Bradshaw, for instance, uh, certainly did. The trouble is uh, with this, although there may be some, uh, you know, a uh, a, tr a, a truth in this based on the traditions of the Constitution, it misses or it kind of ignores the, the fact and the reality that referendums have become, like it or not, a significant part of our constitutional practice. And simply to overrule them would be uh, politically very problematic and very uh, 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 tricky to do. So that leaves... Uh, uh, an, another conundrum. It also opens the question of how much interpretation can Parliament put on these things? To what extent, uh, wh when does interpretation become, if you like, or start to clash with 
the will of the people, whatever that is. Um, is there, in fact, a moral and political case for popular sovereignty that we need to acknowledge, um, uh, even as Remainers? Okay, number three. Am I okay in terms of time? Number three, a partnership argument. Government needs parliamentary support to achieve the best possible outcome. Uh, parliament, uh, 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 parliament's representative role can help to uh, 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 produce a, uh, uh, if you like, a position that the whole nation can support, both leavers um, and, uh, and remainers. Or the complexity of the process, the, 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 the wide range of issues involved from citizenship rights uh, uh, to uh, fishing, to agriculture, to trade relations and all the rest of it require a, 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 a level of engagement beyond uh, simply a small number of people uh, in government. It needs to be debated and thought through and reasoned. And um, it will support the government in getting a better deal. So this idea of Parliament asserting its role as a partner with the executive. Now this is perhaps offers in some sense a neat solution because it also accepts if you like, that the, the referendum is valid, if you like, that maybe we don't like it, but we have to accept it, but we can work with government to produce the kind of uh, response, if you like, that would be uh, most satisfactory to everyone. So there's an appeal, if you like, to national unity, national interest, and so on. Um, okay, that seems quite neat, but how do we arbitrate what the roles of those different kind of elements are. You know, what is, what role do, does Parliament actually have here? And what are the limits to their authority? The same with the executive, the same with the people. Okay, number four. And this is the, another element that kind of complicates the mix a little bit more, that sometimes uh, uh, perhaps gets forgotten. We are very aware of the issue of the border of Northern Ireland, for instance, but maybe sometimes less aware of uh, um, the uh, impact of the uh, devolved uh, assemblies. Um, and uh, although the UK is not a federal state as such, and the referendum was certainly a UK-wide referendum, nonetheless, it is... Uh, a, a, a federal in practice in some respects, in a kind of quasi way, in a kind of lopsided way, in a way that doesn't really, it's not very evenly uh, set out, but is nonetheless uh, a fact that, you know, Scotland in particular has a moral claim and a political claim to uh, uh, some level of say in the process, whether that be simply because for out of principle or for very practical reasons uh, to do with Scotland's own particular uh, uh, economic and political priorities and needs. Not to mention the fact that Scotland voted differently to the rest of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. So this creates, um, I'll take questions later, this, this uh, uh, creates another tension. How should these relationships be managed? Um, in the system. Okay. And then finally, number five, <coughs> perhaps very current now, voters have the right to accept or reject the terms of any deal in a referendum. Now, in that first six months after the referendum, this was an extremely niche position. There were a small number of MPs who did raise this and who did press this. Uh, Gareth Davies has been almost obsessed with it. Uh, uh, since uh, 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 for the last two years um, but also people like Owen Smith and so on um, now the, this uh, uh, nonetheless has gained greater credence I really expected this argument to drop away after a period of time but I think possibly the parliamentary arithmetic we're in now the kind of impasse we're in uh, uh, means that it has gathered momentum and of course now we have the People's Vote campaign 
which I think is rapidly becoming the key focus of many of us, uh, uh, many of us here. And this is one of the. There's a really important constitutional reason I think why this is uh, 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 um, uh, uh, right too, because it embraces the fact. I talked about this. This flexible constitution, this evolving <coughs> political constitution, okay, and, and and the fact that referendums have become, uh, uh, like it or not, uh, a part of the way we do things. Scotland, um, uh, devolution, for instance, was sanctioned by a referendum. Um, we've had uh, uh, referendums on the voting system. We've had referendums in Scotland on independence and so on. These have become a normal part of the way we do things, particularly around constitutional issues. So this solution embraces the fact of popular sovereignty and the fact that it's entered into the way that the British political system. And it's perhaps, given what initiated this process, the only kind of satisfactory way of legitimising the outcome. Um, but then there's a question that this leaves. We can, we can make that argument, and I think there's a powerful case uh, 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 to be made. But if we leave it there, we make the same mistakes that we've always made before, which is, how do we decide when things like referendums are appropriate or legitimate? How do we ensure that they're not used and abused um, in, uh, 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 in ways that would not be conducive to a stable uh, 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 political system governed by the rule of law, the democracy, and so on. So these are all questions that we have to address. And this underlines, I think, an argument for codification. And I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this, but the point is, we don't have any means of governing and understanding and having clarity about what the relationship between all these different parts of the Constitution are that have very, can have a very significant effect, has had, is having a very significant effect on our future. Yeah? So a constitutional settlement is needed, I think, to govern the relationship between these different aspects. We have to accept and embrace the fact that referendums have become part of the way we do things. And then the people's vote, I think, is a way of embracing that and uh, staying uh, 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 true to our position um, as Remainers. That's it. Thank you.